and I tell all of our residents and all of our fellows, you ask me how I built my career, how it went from reconstructive to purely aesthetic. I tell them that model doesn't work anymore. We're talking about 1978 when I finished my residency. I tell them today, from day one, you don't apologize that you want to be an aesthetic surgeon. Try to get a fellowship. Don't be shy of getting involved in social media. There'll be senior plastic surgeons in your community who may resent it, who may castigate you for doing it, but that's the way you build your practice. Welcome back to the Technology of Beauty, where we have a chance to interview the movers and shakers of the beauty business. All things aesthetics on this program, and today is no exception. Today I'm going to be interviewing the most important aesthetic physician in the world. That's right. He has more name recognition than any single physician in the beauty business, in the aesthetics business. This is Dr. Fouad Nahai. Dr. Nahai is one of only two individuals who's been the president of the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery as well as the International Society of Aesthetics. The only other one is Renato Saltz. He also is the sitting uh, editor of the Aesthetic Surgery Journal. And as such, he's the only one in the world to hold those three titles. He has numerous other titles. He's been a visiting professor all over the world. He's been given accolades and diplomas and honorary memberships to many societies all over the world. His passport is even fuller than mine. In addition to that, he's been a traveling and visiting professor in the United States, as well as, as I mentioned, all over the world. I am so happy to welcome him, and I'm so honored that he would be here on the program. I also want to share a couple other things with you. He is right now in Park City, Deer Valley, where he is at the American-Brazilian Aesthetic Medicine Meeting. He is chairing the session tonight. He's taken time out of his busy schedule to be with us on this program. He's dressed to go skiing because after this interview, he's going right up onto the slopes and skiing with his Brazilian buddies and his buddies from all over the world and, of course, with Renato Saltz. So with no further ado... Thank you, Dr. Nahai, for joining us, for taking time out, and for gracing us and me with your presence. Thank you, Grant. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Well, thank you. So, for the few people on the planet Earth who do not know who you are, let's start with, who are you? Where do you live? Tell me a little bit about your education, your travels, and how did you get here? And I know it could go for a week. So let's try to move it along. I'll be very brief. (laughs) I I was born in Iran. My dad made the right decision to send me to England to boarding school for my education. I then made the right decision to go to medical school in England, graduated, then made another right decision to come to this country as an immigrant to pursue my training in, in surgery. I finished my surgical training, or at least within weeks of finishing, I decided maybe I want to be a plastic surgeon. They're they're doing a lot of innovative things at Emory at the time, Bostwick, Ukwitz, Mathis, Vasconez, doing so many interesting things. So another good decision, I decided to become a plastic surgeon. I became uh, interested and involved with microsurgery, muscle flaps, and that evolved evolved to uh, aesthetic surgery. I was very fortunate to be involved in the leadership of both the Aesthetic Society and particularly the International Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Given my background, born in one continent, grew up in another, living in a third, I've enjoyed traveling. I've had a keen interest on in other countries in how our colleagues elsewhere do things. So it's all come together for me extremely well as editor of the Aesthetic Surgery Journal, which uh, with all humility, 
I'll say, is the leading aesthetic surgery journal. And with my knowledge of the international global aesthetic surgery world, it's helped me also to build the journal. So that's how I've got here. My career in and out of academics, I was very, very honored to be the first to have an endowed chair that was named after Maurice Ukewitz, who founded the plastic surgery program at Emory, following a uh, long relationship with Emory, which I still continue last fall for many reasons. The main one being that Emory closed the aesthetic center. I left and I'm now in practice with my son on the north side of Atlanta. So I live in Atlanta, Georgia, where I have been for the past 49 years. And this July, my wife Shannos and I will celebrate 50 years in the United States. And I should say 50 wonderful years and probably the most effective decision I ever made was to come to the United States to continue my training and call it home. And to become a proud United States citizen. Absolutely. That's right. 40 years. That's amazing. And congratulations. That's fantastic. You know, you just reminded me of something. You remember where you were after you left your residency with Steve Mathis? You did residency yes. with Dr. Steve Mathis in San Francisco, correct? When, when both Steve at Emory, Steve finished his training, went to Washington University in St. Louis. He and I were actually working on, on a couple of books on muscle flaps, which necessitated detailed dissection of the vascular blood supply to muscles. I had done a little in the lab at Emory. Steve had access to the lab at Wash U and a very handsome, enthusiastic, young Wash U medical student came and introduced himself as Grant Stevens to me. <laughs> you and, and I go back over 40 well, years. Well, I just thought about that. I'm getting pins and needles. I did, that was either 76 or 77, right? I, exactly. And I remember meeting, meeting you and Dr. Mathis, and I was a first-year student. And that means that I've, that you're, I, so I met my first plastic surgeon then, and you were the first plastic surgeon I ever met because I didn't know Dr. Paul Weeks then. Dr. Paul Weeks went on to be my chairman and encouraged me to become a plastic surgeon during my second year. So that means I've known you longer than any other plastic surgeon in the universe. <laughs> well, you just made my day. <laughs> Paul Weeks was also the chairman at the time yeah. that I was. I would shuttle between Atlanta and St. Louis, work during the day, meet with Steve at the end of his day, spent a lot of time with you doing, doing some of our Scott work. Do you remember Dr. Peterson, the head of anatomy? Yes, I do. He's the one who hired me to get those cadavers ready for you on your myocutaneous book, the, uh, the blue book. And you did a good job. Uh, you're very kind. So... I met you then. I didn't know I was going to be a plastic surgeon. And then Dr. Weeks encouraged me to become one. So, And you started actually in reconstructive plastic surgery, right? Yes, I did. And tell me, when did you start transitioning towards the world of aesthetics? It took about four or five years as I built a reputation as a reconstructive plastic surgeon. Patients would then ask me, can you do this? Can you do this? So the reputation built, and as I became busier with, on the aesthetic side, and the, the department had hired younger individuals who wanted to establish their careers, I started handing them the reconstructive the microsurgery and became busy and eventually full-time doing aesthetic surgery. Mm -hmm. And you've been doing that ever since, correct? Yes. So would you let us know what your favorite operation is? The most challenging operations are rhinoplasties and 
Blepharoplasty, my favorite, is uh, face and neck lift. Uh-huh. And why is that? Because I've done so many, because it's one of those operations that what you do is there for the entire world to see. There's very, very little room for error, whether it's the work that you do underneath, the placement of the scars, where they place them, what you do with the hairline, what you do with the tragus, what you do with the earlobe. Everything is there for the entire world to scrutinize and grade you. And I also learned, and I just told our own fellow last week when he was so impressed with the immediate result of a facelift, I said, you know, in this business, working on something that's out there for the entire world to see, you're only as good as your last patient, your last result. And I even told him, I said, you know, if a superstar quarterback throws an interception, next time he throws a touchdown, everybody forgets. But if a, if a superstar surgeon or any surgeon has a complication, it haunts them for a long time. For some people, it may haunt them for their entire career. Indeed. You've... You've educated so many of us and so many residents, medical students, fellows, and persons like myself. You're a mentor of mine. You've taught me so much over the years. Share with us some of the most important principles you believe, either in facial aesthetic surgery or just aesthetics in general. Just share some of us with us, your, your truisms, your concepts, your philosophies, please. Well, the first thing, as I mentioned, your result is out there for everyone to see and you are as good as your last result. The difference between reconstructive and aesthetic is that you have to have your own sense of aesthetics. Unfortunately, what is happening today is that some surgeons, I don't know if it's because they want to make the face as tight as they can, or because they feel that's what the patient wants. The natural look is something that has escaped a lot of people. There are many, many celebrities out there with what I call the unnatural, unnatural look. So the first thing I try to impart to our residents and fellows is find out what your patient wants. Spend time with them. Sit back and listen. Don't be in a hurry. And always have them come back for a second discussion. Have them bring you images from 5, 15, 20 years ago. See where the eyebrow position was. See what their jawline looked like. Because most patients want to have their rejuvenation reflect how they used to look. Admittedly, some people do come in and want a drastic change, but that's a completely different story. But for the typical patient who comes in, listen, what are they looking for? And I still, despite the fact that uh, I show my patients pictures of my own cases, the number one concern of patients when they come to see me, I want to look natural, I don't want to look pulled, I don't want to look exaggerated and, uh, you know, I don't want to mention celebrities. There's one in particular that right now has very, very marked joker lines. Her image is all over the place and the patients tell me they don't want to look like that particular individual. So key is to listen, try to find out what the patient really wants then deliver it in such a manner that you're not leaving them with telltale signs that they've had a facelift and you're leaving them with a natural appearance. Uh, one of the things that I can't say I enjoy, but one of the things that I chuckle about when my wife Shannos and I go to charity events or large events is looking around and just looking at somebody's ear, I can tell they've had a facelift. 
and I, I grade their surgeons, you know, A, A, A minus, and there's a, unfortunately a lot of bad surgery, unnatural surgery out there. Yes. When it's natural and when it's excellent surgery, you don't know. Unfortunately, exactly. unfortunately, when you when it's unnatural and the ears distorted, the scars are visible, the hairlines distorted, this, and so forth, and the different stigmata of a bad face, you know. So when people say, "Oh, I can always tell," I respond, "No, you can't always tell. You can just always tell on the bad ones, but on the great ones and on the good ones, you can rarely tell if you've exactly. done a great job." I, I couldn't agree with you more. I uh, have had that same discussion with my fellows so many times, and I'm reflecting. I'm thinking, I probably learned that from you. Uh, I says, you've taught me so much as we've traveled the world. I also thought of something else I'd like you to share with our viewers and listeners about the time we were in Brazil. Maybe at the American-Brazilian meeting. I'm not sure, but I had the good fortune of flying home with you on Delta to Atlanta, your home, and then picking it up from there to L.A. But I remember driving to the airport, and I've heard you tell this story before, and it always cracks me up, and I know the viewers and listeners will get a kick out of it. So share with them our trip home from Sao Paulo. Well, <laughs> you and I you sat in the, uh, in, 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 in the business class lounge, and unknown to me, you gathered a whole stack of the Delta in flight magazine that happened to have my picture in it and stuffed them into my into my briefcase. You and I were both dressed with tie, jacket, perfect, because we've just been lecturing, brought to the airport. We get on the plane and you're across the aisle from me and you disappear. The next thing I know, you're back, you've got your night attire on. <laughs> Pajamas. <laughs> You're so proper. You're so British. And I Night attire. And I said, <laughs> and I said, Granto, I liked you more in your pink shirt. And there's one time you and I flew back together from uh, Istanbul to uh, to New York. Then I came to Atlanta. You went back to L.A. Uh, we were the first two to get on the plane. It was a, a attractive Delta flight attendant who said. Hello, my name is Venus, and you turned around and said, I'm Apollo, and that's Zeus pointing at me. It was so spontaneous, <laughs> and you know how often I've enjoyed telling that story. <laughs> I really have traveled the world, and again, it's enriched my life. Beyond that, it's increased my ability to see the entire picture. It's given me the opportunity to look at different procedures, which ones work, which ones work best, which ones are for me, and which ones I'm going to avoid. And that's also enriched me as an educator, as it has you, because we see other people from other cultures, other backgrounds, and how they operate, how they do the same things. Now I think with the, uh, with social media, with virtual meetings, even that world is being flattened so that we can tell what everybody's doing without traveling as extensively as you and I do. So you bring up social media, and that was one of my questions I wanted to ask you about. You've seen so many stages and phases of promotion and marketing and so forth. And I remember when I first had my first website in 1994, and it was shocking to all of you people in power. And in fact, I was actually brought up before, before an ethics committee on having naked bodies on a computer. And that was the allegation and, and so forth. And since then, the rest is history, as they say, right? And I remember telling Dr. Harvey Zirum, Dr. Zirum, before you are gone, There'll be no yellow pages. There'll be no print ads. It'll all be on, as you said, a computer. That's what they called the Internet. Now, you've seen the emergence of not only websites and digital media, but you just mentioned social media. What, what's your reaction to the present social media climate we're in now and perhaps the past? And what do you see in the future for social media? And do you think it's appropriate what you see? It's, it's interesting that one of the talks that I'm giving this evening has to do with a paper that was published in 2008 
with Renato as the lead author about us as plastic surgeons getting involved in the injectable world or we'd be left behind. And I went and reread that paper, and the immediate person I thought of was you. And I said, you know, this is reminiscent of the early days when Grant was being ostracized. <laughs> as you said, I wasn't on any of those committees. I know you weren't. I know you weren't. I know you were brought, brought up on those committees. <laughs> you were, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> You're making me laugh so much. <laughs> it's good for you. It was, you were a visionary, you were a leader, you were trying to tell us something. And instead of listening, adopting it, helping it grow, help it, help our practices grow. I'm going to say the establishment. I don't want to mention any names. The establishment was fighting you, but there were a few, and I have to admit, and I'd love to be included in them, but Robert, Sing Robert Singer is a standout saying, you guys have to listen to this. And I tell all of our residents and all of our fellows, you ask me how I built my career, how it went from reconstructive to purely aesthetic. I tell them that model doesn't work anymore. We're talking about 1978 when I finished my residency. I tell them today, from day one, you don't apologize that you want to be an aesthetic surgeon. Try to get a fellowship. Don't be shy of getting involved in social media. There'll be senior plastic surgeons in your community who may resent it, who may castigate you for doing it, but that's the way you build your practice. Do I have concerns about social media? Yes. As editor of the journal, I read every single paper that comes in, every submission, and the concerns that we as board certified plastic surgeons, as members of the aesthetic society, are not as well represented as those who are, for want of a better word, less qualified. I'm not going to say less trained. I'll say less qualified. So social media are here to stay. And there was a very interesting paper in ASJ looking at academics and private and the differences between their presence on social media it was very, very telling. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I agree with everything you just said for the young residents and fellows out there. And, and the problem is I moved their cheese and I disrupted uh, the status quo. And I want to give accolades and thanks to Dr. Singer also. I agree with you. Initially, he wasn't so happy, but he then became a very ardent supporter of myself and and so forth, and, and, and also Renato Saltz during his presidency, and you, and I want to thank all three of you and the others who did, certainly. And there are other young people coming through and coming out now, and they're embracing other means of communication and marketing, of education, uh, and I think we, haven't, we can't even hardly imagine what the future holds. There's a company called Engage uh, Media that uses QR codes in a drip-based educational process that I think is going to be something that we're going to be seeing in the next few years as the way in which patients are educated and doctors are educated. Uh, QR codes are being embraced all over the United States. So they, they've been around for over 10 years. Finally, uh, thanks to COVID, I think, we are now embracing QR codes. Now, I want to change subjects. I would really love to know your opinion on something. Right now, we have four neuromodulators or toxins. I don't like the word toxin, but uh, we have four Botoxes, if you will. There's the Botox, the 800-pound gorilla. And then, of course, we have Desport, uh, Xeomin, and Evolus has uh, Juveau. And those are the four that are clinically available, uh, commercially available in the United States presently. There are many others in the world, and you know that, and a number of our viewers and listeners do know that. Now, one other data point for the viewers and listeners that may not know, but Botox itself generates over $4 billion a year for Allergan or AbbVie, uh, about $4.2 billion a year. 
And of that, more than half of that is for therapeutics. In other words, non-wrinkles, non-cosmetic use. It's therapeutic use of Botox. Uh, a lot of folks don't appreciate that fact. We also know that Botox should be administered about every three to four months, depending on what you believe, but three or four times a year. We now have a fifth toxin about to enter the marketplace, and we're told that it lasts twice as long. We don't know. I haven't used it. I'm not sure if you've used it. But the data is pretty clear that it appears to last longer. The most recent therapeutic indications appear 26 weeks as opposed to half that time for Botox. I've asked a number of people, mm -hmm. such as yourself, what effects you think that might have on consumer behavior and even on government behavior as it relates to the therapeutic. So theoretically, hypothetically, I'd ask you, Dr. Nahai, if I had a toxin that lasts three months or one that lasts six months, Tell me what you think, how that's going to affect your behavior, your parent, your patient's behavior, and perhaps even the third-party payer's behavior. Well, I'm going to back up, uh, back up a little and say I'm aware of that, uh, the work that's being done, and I'm publicly going to say I hope that when, when that's written up, it comes to the right journal. <laughs> Having said that, uh, Grant, I think it's going to come down to dollars. I think if for six months or one, one injection six months or two injections will last you six months at a three-month interval, yes, the, the, there's the question of convenience. But the other question is, is cost. Is it going to be more expensive to have one shot and have it last six months, or will it be the same price? If it's the same price, then I think we as providers are going to be concerned about what it might do to our bottom line. But when we put our patient's best interest at heart, it means they don't have to come every three months. They don't have to take off and come to our office, wait to be injected. So my prediction would be that for the majority of patients that are cost conscious, if two injections is less expensive than the one for six months, then that's what they will choose. For me, regardless, I would pick the six months because when I feel I'm ready, I have to chase the fellows and residents say, hey, now you, you, get, you get to work on me now. This is how I want you to do it. But frankly, I think it all comes down balancing cost versus convenience and how much you and I and our patients are willing to pay for the convenience of two shots a year instead of three or four. Well, I would like to add to that. It's not just that cost, but there's the cost of the time, how you value your time. If I can come in for two haircuts a year versus four haircuts a year, uh, what's my time worth? Uh, yeah. So there's one issue. The other thing is it's not a haircut. They're putting sharp objects in our face. So if I could have eight needle sticks or 16 needle sticks, I would choose eight because I don't particularly care to have needles in my face. Uh, so there are other issues I think involved besides cost, and I would actually encourage them to make it a premium. I would personally, if I were them, and I have no say on, on any of this, but I think they have every reason to have a premium price associated with it just because they're saving me time and saving me pain. <laughs> so uh, the other thing is I'm curious about the therapeutic. Do you think the government or the third party, ca party carriers will move towards the longer acting toxin or do you think they'll just stick with the, the existing Well, one? I think the third party carriers and the government, their priority is cost. Mm -hmm. I think they'll take that to, into account. And you made an excellent point that the, the my time, if, if I had to drive somewhere to get my injections and the value I put on it, but I don't think that would be universal. I think for some people, the difference in price, they may say, well, you know, it's an extra hour of eight, four injections, but compared with their income, it's not going to be as, if, as cost effective to do it just the one time. 
Okay. There's one other factor I'd like you to opine on, and that is if you look at Allergan's own data from Brilliant Distinctions, or if you look at the, real, uh, the Hint MD data from a number of practices, what we find is that the average person and what they have pu- uh, published, the average person actually receives less than two uh, uh, Botox injections a year. I've seen 1.6 uh, I've seen 1.4, I've seen 1.8, but in all cases, all the data I've seen, it's always less than twice a year. And yet we know it only lasts approximately three months. So by definition, if they're only coming in, say, twice a year, we know they're therapeutic, non-therapeutic, therapeutic, non-therapeutic. In other words, half of the year, they're not enjoying the positives, the therapeutic or the aesthetic advantages of the neuromodulator. So now a setting time aside, a t- a setting the sticks aside, and the opportunity cost aside, I want to talk about the effectiveness. If something lasts six months and they come in twice a year, same as they're doing now, and now they would be, I would think, therapeutic all year long, not therapeutic, non-therapeutic, and so forth. What effect do you think that will have on physician behavior or consumer behavior? Again, I think most consumers would obviously want the flat line that you just described and two office visits a year as opposed to three or four. So it, it, this whole discussion is wonderful. The reason it's wonderful is because our patient, the, the consumer, will now have a choice and decide what you want to do. You know, when you go out to buy a product, you will know if you buy product X may last you 10 years, the product Y may last you 25 years. So these are conscious decisions that the consumer will make. The wonderful thing is that they will have that choice. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that entirely. Okay, changing gears. How has COVID affected you uh, and your family, your practice since well, it's affected my family in that uh, we haven't been able to travel to Texas as regularly as we would like to see our children, our, our daughter, her husband, and grandchildren. My wife, Shanna, misses it very much. Uh, my son has kept himself and his family away from us. We're not able to go out and enjoy our friends. If we invite anyone to our home, it has to be a very small gathering. So that's on the social, personal side. On the professional side, uh, the lockdown gave me some extra time to work in the backyard. I love gardening. I'm, I'm at peace when I'm doing things and planting and grooming and fertilizing. Gave me time to catch up on some of my own writings. The uh, submissions to ASJ skyrocketed. <laughs> to spend more time on the journal. I missed my patients. Uh, finally, we went back. But most of all, I missed the live meetings I would go to to see patients. In fact, this meeting in Park City is the first one I've attended live in about a year. So that's the effect it has had beyond the effect on our practice, beyond having to wear a mask when I go in to see a patient, ask her to remove hers so I can effectively evaluate their face. Someone comes in for blepharoplasty. I want to see the whole face because they may need more than just the eyelids. So when I tell them, you know, in order to give you a good recommendation, I have to see your whole face. We keep our distances. I tell them I've had both of my vaccines and I'm going to keep my mask on. So there's been a huge, huge disruption affecting me on a personal level, professional level. And when I talk about my professional level, my priority are my patients. They, They are absolutely number one. My second professional priority are what I call my academic pursuits, writing my books, uh, uh, being editor of the journal and talking about 
books, you were kind enough to edit a whole section <laughs> in the third edition of the Art of Aesthetic Surgery. And we had such huge plans to promote the book for live events at the Aesthetic Society, at the ISAPS meeting in Vienna, at the ASPS meetings. All of those went by the wayside. So huge disruption, but I'm still standing. I'm happy. I'm smiling. And I know it won't last forever, but it, it, it'll change things. I mentioned that I had to relocate my practice. I had a one and a half mile drive between home and the Emory Aesthetic Center. Now it's 12 miles on a very busy interstate. And I sometimes think of you <laughs> and your electric vehicle so you could get into the HOV lane. Yes, yes. Well, certainly it's affected all of us. I'm happy you shared with everybody that you've had the, the vaccination, both of them. I trust your lovely wife, my girlfriend, has also been immunized and vaccinated. <laughs> She's only had the first. <laughs> oh, my. She, You're discriminating uh, against my girlfriend? Now that you mentioned that, when I said, I, I, I have something planned with Grant for noon. She says, well, I have reservations for you at his and your favorite place. She said, tell him for him, I'll rearrange it. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Please give her my, my love when you see her later I on will. today. She means the most to me. I also want to note, for those of you who are watching, the Aesthetic Surgery Journal is his background and also our beloved Aesthetic Society logo, the new logo that came into existence during my presidency. And, uh, and, and the Aesthetic Surgery Journal is the official journal of the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Thank you, Dr. Nahai, for placing that uh, as your backdrop. Now, I would like to conclude with asking your... Um, your opinion, opinions about the future of aesthetic surgery, aesthetic medicine. What do you see if you pull out your crystal ball, and I know you must have one, and you look into your crystal ball over the next year, three, five, even 10 years out, what are we going to see in your estimation in the field of aesthetic surgery and aesthetic medicine? I think I'll, you just use the right, you, you put the two together. And the one thing that has had an incredible, profound effect, and I think we're just touching the surface, is regenerative medicine. I used to say fat grafting and everything that comes from there, but regenerative medicine. Uh, we can call it stem cells, but a better description would be the SVF. And what's, what we've been able to do so far with SDF, with fat grafting, and facial rejuvenation is incredible. But I think we're just scratching at the surface. And I'm going to expand that to other areas that most of us who have a plastic surgery background and aesthetic surgery, reconstructive background, the effect that that will have there. So that to me is the big thing. We're just scratching at the surface. <clears throat> The other big thing is what we will be able to achieve with our partners in industry. You just, you just, one example you just gave, absolutely. Why stop at six months? Could we make it a year? Uh, the fillers, the level of sophistication, the evolution of the fillers that we have seen in the past several years is is unbelievable. <clears throat> so partnership with industry, what we want or what we feel our patients want and what is possible through bioengineering, I'm sure that we're going to see incredible improvement there. One of the areas that I feel and would like to see a lot more improvement is the tissue tightening, the induction of collagen. We've already come a long way from the original radio frequency machines that work a certain percent of the time. 
those technologies are continuing to be refined. And I think one day I won't be able to get up on the podium and say, adding volume to get to solve the skin laxity problem will not work. You have to remove the skin. I, I like to think I'd be able to say, replacing the volume, inducing collagen without making any incisions is the way to go. So that's the direction we're going. Uh, in terms of body contouring, there's already been significant improvement in the non-invasive ablation. I, I anticipate further improvement there. So I think the growth we'll see will be in the non-invasives. Surgically, I think the pendulum is going to swing again. You remember the days when everything was endoscopic, non-invasive, don't leave a patient with a scar. And I remember getting up and saying, it's not the length of it's the quality that counts. I think that pendulum is going to swing again towards trying to see if, if we can do more non do more through limited incisions. I would entirely agree with you. Now, uh, it sounds like you're going to be talking about the 747 paper this evening from what you said. Exactly. And I just want to remind you that I have said many times from the podium that it's actually a 787 or a maybe even a 797 at this point. And uh, you may want to keep that in mind and pass that on to my Brazilian and international friends. Well, he's be to to they, they have a talk following... Well, my talk is, is the 747 effect still valid in 2021? The talk following me is 757, but I agree with you. Yeah, it's way beyond 57, I know it, that. It, it continues climbing, uh, <clears throat> looking at the crystal ball. Yes, we're all going to have far more competition than we do today, but that news is balanced by the fact that the market is going to continue to grow. Absolutely. Continue to grow. And the growth in non-surgical aesthetics is tenfold, at least tenfold greater, the rate at which it's growing, at least tenfold greater than surgical aesthetic uh, interventions and so forth, which is not to take anything away from surgery. It's really a reflection on the growth, the unbelievable growth in non-surgical and minimally invasive. Well, I could talk to you forever. You need to get out on the slopes uh, I guess yes. in this case, I'm going to say don't break a leg and uh, give my regards to all that are there. And thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your time with us, Dr. Nahai. I would also like to thank all of you for joining us here to the Technology of Beauty. I want to point out that this is the first physician, uh, plastic surgeon that I've ever interviewed in this program. And as I mentioned, with, uh, with no hesitation, he is without a doubt the number one aesthetic physician in the universe, in the United States, in the world. So thank you, Dr. Nahai. And thank, thank you, thank Grant. You're very welcome. And thank you all for joining me on the Technology of Beauty, where I get a chance to interview the leaders, the movers and shakers of the aesthetic business in all things beauty. So thank you very much. We'll see you each and every Tuesday. Take care. Stay safe. Bye-bye.